episode 500. Here we go. Congratulations, mate. <laughs> Thank you. Safely into the FA Cup final with a comfortable win at Wembley and then a Wednesday night to remember as Manchester City piled even more pressure on Arsenal with a complete dismantling at the Etihad. The Gunners still lead the table, but City's hot breath is right on their necks as they sit just two points behind with two games in hand. Welcome to this very special Blue Moon podcast. It's episode 500, 13 years, 8 months and 19 days and 14 major trophies and, crucially, one podcast award. After our very first recording, I I can't explain how how happy I am that Wednesday night's game went the way it did. Good vibes only in the studio for today, I can promise you that. I'm David Mooney and a special show deserves special guests. With me, I've got two former City defenders. I'm joined by Nader Manua. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm not too bad, thank you. And congratulations you. as well. Thank 500 you. is awesome. Thank you very much. Absolutely awesome, yeah. And uh, joining us also, Keith Curl. Hi, David. Thank you for uh, for joining us, Keith. Thank you for uh, for coming in. Um, let's talk then. Uh, we'll start for the first part of the show. We'll start about um, City and Arsenal and the, the general situation at the moment. Um, Keith, what will that dressing room have been like the moment that all the players got back into it on Wednesday night? Um, I think probably there's a there's a, an anticipation. They've uh, they've had a job to do. They would they would have been nerves because they they know the enormity of the task in hand but they were the way they went out and the way that they played they seemed so relaxed so so understanding and again but i think it's a, there's a focus because they know the job's not done but they know what the job is and uh, so i'm not saying they were, would have been relieved after the game but there's um there's a focus about the group that you can tell they know what they're about individually and collectively and they know that they've done their job last night yeah i i kind of wonder if it will, would have like it would have focused minds in the sense of okay everyone thinks the job is done but it ain't done yet everyone being who uh, the players after the game, you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was looking down uh, at them at the final whistle and there were a few cheers, but it's just like a pat on the back, went over, you know, shook some Arsenal players' hands, got involved in a few fights, but then they walked <laughs> off because they know that it's not done yet, but they know that the sort of the tables have turned now because I think for most of the season they've been having, they've had to watch what Arsenal are doing yeah. because they need to know what they need to do in their games. Whereas now Arsenal will have to be watching City, hoping that they can do them a favour. And the way they played, like, it's reward because they've obviously got all the talent in the world, but it looked so prepared yesterday. Mm. Tactically, they knew what they needed to do. They individually, they were, like, doubly motivated to make sure they got things across the line. The fans were great. The atmosphere was incredible. And that's, like, that city at their best at this point in the season. It's like yeah. they come alive. And for those players, they did it. They didn't do it comfortably. They did it well. They did it well. They played really well. What do you mean by that? I mean, when I say comfortably... It wasn't an easy game. They made it easy they made for it look, them. Made it look easy or made it feel easy? They, the way that they played was they stuck to their plan and their plan was the better plan. Mm-hmm. I think Arsenal, in my opinion, I don't know if you agree, Keith, didn't... I feel like they came and expected John Stones to go into midfield. So the way that they were trying to defend City was based around that, which is why all of a sudden Edison can put his foot on the ball and stay there for 10 seconds because they're probably trying to decide, well, who's supposed to go to him? This isn't something that we sort of legislate for. And I don't think they made the necessary tweaks to be able to affect that because now looking at it, City probably had 15 minutes worth of possession where Edison or the centre-backs just had it and there was nobody coming near to them. Yeah. Um, so that draws Arsenal out. Some of the movements, like people were working hard, they were tracking back, they were running forward together and they were making the right decisions. And like I said, it made it look comfortable, but Arsenal playing like that would probably win against maybe 80% of the league. But City somehow just limited their options. They were aggressive when Arsenal had the ball. And they kind of knew Arsenal didn't want to stretch the game in behind as well. And when teams do that and become one-dimensional, that level of aggression, it makes it easier. But it, like I say, it's not easy because they did play against the side who are still technically top of the league. But yeah. Don't you think that, uh, or how much time do you think goes into um, Pep's thinking of the opposition? Because again, mm-hmm. you get a lot of coaches nowadays, the focus is on what they're going to do and how we're going to play as a team. But you get the feeling that Pep's going to think, right, well, if we... If we I think they're going to think we're going to set up like this. Yeah. So they're going to they're going to do this. This is going to ha- this is going to be their mindset of how they're going to stop us from playing. And when they do that, this is how we bypass that. Yeah. Which is which is which is that no, they are the next level on. Yeah. And not not only as coaches uh, and as players, but as, as as a team. So they can counter a counter attack. So yeah, it's like inviting the press and say so. As soon as we get them to come and press us, we want them to press us, yeah. and then we're going to bypass it. And when we bypass it, yeah. this is a movement to be. 
quickly. So it's gone to very quickly going on to the next level. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, unfortunately, with a lot of coaches, uh, it falls down on trying to keep possession and inviting yeah, the press yeah, because exactly. that's the risk and the reward. Yeah, it's possession with a purpose, isn't it? Definitely. And Interestingly, we look back at the game against Bayern Munich and for as much as the first leg was great and the way they played, in the second leg, the de decisive moment is John Stones kicking it long, yeah. Haaland heading it down to De Bruyne, De Bruyne playing in Haaland, Haaland scoring. There's an element of simplicity that still comes for it. And I thought in that game yesterday as well, I remember earlier in the season, City played against Brighton and Brighton were really good in that game. Yeah, they were yeah. really, really yeah, good. Yeah. And they were aggressive in their press. They went sort of man-to-man -man at the back as, say, Arsenal did yesterday. And there were times where City, and the same was in the, in the Arsenal game in the FA Cup, City would go longer to Haaland. But I felt like the thing that was missing was what would happen next. The link. Yeah. yeah, whereas yesterday, the timing of the link, it's like they knew. There was, there was a number of times, wasn't there? De Bruyne was, I mean, he, he, was, like, Came on, he, knew. he was in arm's length of, of Haaland at times because he knew he was going to get the flick. And there's, in my opinion, there's certain things which are quite simple in football. When the ball goes over your head, you turn and you go in that other direction as quick as you can to anticipate that second yeah. ball. And De Bruyne, for his goal, he started off two yards behind Partey and finished off two yards in front of Partey. Yeah. But he knew the ball was going to Haaland. Great hold-up play by him. Great set. And that changes the dynamic because it's not just a hopeful long ball. I'll just, just stick, let it stick up there. Yeah. Make it happen. There's structure to this. And I think that's because they know that's something that they have to do going forward. Because if you're going to have the big guy up there, it's great when he's by himself. But it's even better when you've got players coming underneath to go and take the ball and take the territory. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, uh, on the flip side, what will the Arsenal dressing room be like now? Because they've they've picked up three points from the last possible 12 now, and it was in their hands, it's now in City's hands. Is there a case of you get back into that dressing room and, and everybody's kind of oh, slumped down and... Like, like, what? What's uh, have a city just basically crushing the spirit at the moment? Is that what? Is that what's going on? Again, I think very much now. Uh, Arteta will, uh, Arte will be thinking about himself, uh, his team, and uh, they're still top of the league, uh, mm. and uh, and that's what they've got to focus on now. You know, they've got to win every game from now to the end of the season, and that's what his focus will be now. Yeah, yeah. like they've been beat by City, not a disgrace. Yeah, a football club doesn't fall apart, or a team doesn't fall apart yeah. because okay, of we start again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we start again. Right, our job from now to the end of the season is we've got to win every one of our games from now to the end of the season if it's good enough excellent we accept it yep. and, and we win the league if City falter in any way yeah, that's down to them mm. but our focus has got to be on us and what we do individually collectively as a team yeah. uh, and again yeah. you've got to say from uh, last night uh, it wasn't evident why uh, Arsenal are top of the league but yeah. you've got to give them credit because they're bit, they're, you know, they are there for a reason they've been there for, for a reason absolutely um, yeah but it's no disgrace to be uh, to get beat by City. Yeah. To put it into perspective, if they win their last games, they finish on 90 points. Yeah. You know, they're not going to finish on 80 and say, oh, it's a bit of a scruffy season. Yeah. It's 90 points. <laughs> yeah. And most seasons, that's more than enough. Yeah. And you do wonder for them now, like the aim is to win those five. But for them to be having to watch City hoping they drop points, whilst also knowing themselves that they can't afford to drop points, yeah. I think that's the... Does that's that, the does that pressure get to you? Uh, listen, everyone listening knows I was never involved in a title race, so <laughs> I wasn't I, I, I can't I, go into that too much. You, but, you have everyone has aims and objectives. Yeah, uh, do you know what? It, I'll get the example I can give. So when I was in a championship with QPR, um, we were one of the teams supposed to be up near the top, and it was us, Leicester, and Burnley. Yeah, and we went through a spell where we'd be winning, and then we checked the results. Leicester had won again. Leicester went on a, I think, it was a twenty-one or twenty-three on gate unbeaten streak, yeah. and the vast majority of those were wins. So when you think you're going to make ground and you check the scoreline and you see that you haven't made up anything, that's not nice. But then when you drop points and you see what they've done and they've not dropped points, mm. it can be a bit demoralising. And I think for this Arsenal side, if I was to think what their dressing room would be like, you know, they can say, come on, boys, it's not over. But it doesn't feel the same as it would have done two weeks ago when yeah. they say, come on, it's not over after drawing at Anfield. Because now that's, uh, that's four results now where they would think that they should have done better. Mm. And now they know as they walk out, they're going to face a lot of criticism. There's going to be a lot of questions asked. And the next game, you know, it's against Chelsea. I don't know if this is like 2023 Chelsea or like a different Chelsea that might do it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, at this point, they've become the underdog. Does that suit them? Maybe. Does it suit them against Man City? Probably, Probably not. not. Yeah, yeah, that's the downside for them, I yeah. think. Well, I've got uh, two great defenders in the studio. Let's talk about the defence. I know, I know, City have just won four-one, but let's. I mean, I want to talk about uh, the way they did it at the back because Keith, that that 
John Stones and Ruben Diaz partnership was back together. And as Nadim said before about Arsenal possibly planning for um, John Stones to move into midfield, he didn't. Um, what I mean, first off, I mean, in terms of a centre back and a partner, what's what's it like having somebody next to you who you can just depend on? Yeah, I think that reliability of, of their decision making and that understanding of you know where someone's going to be uh, is vital, and that's something that you can that you pick up through a number of games that, that you get together. And sometimes there's nothing worse. I remember being two 0 up uh, against Man United um, uh, for Man City, and we're cruising. And the game's comfortable. I was going to say I remember it well, but uh, well isn't the right word. No, no, well, I remember, yeah, and then again, the balls come out, the balls come in the air, Michael Vonk, and you're thinking, all you've got to do, Michael, is just edit straight back over the halfway line. Tries being clever because we're 2 0 up, and he wants to showboat, and he tries heading it down. Next thing it's 2 1, then it's 2 all, then it's 3 2. Like, by one mistake, one error, one decision making, that, that reliability. Change the flow of the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah completely. It's do what you need to be doing. Again, but then as a partnership, um, it's vitally important that you get you've got that understanding. Um, and I, I was lucky enough. I played with some very good defenders, not only as a, as a partner but also in a back four and a, uh, in a back three. And I was always the one that played deep because I wanted to be seeing what everybody else was doing and I could control what everybody else was doing because because I had pace and I could cover them. I didn't like to be the one that was reliant on somebody else. Mm. But that was just me as uh, as an individual how I played. Yeah, mm. I looked up the stats. Do you know who you played? You know which defender you played alongside the most at City. Um, well, when, when I first went there, was, uh, I played with Colin Hendry, then it was Steve Redmond, uh, then it was Michael Vonk. Uh, and then there's, it was, then there's, it was, there's no centre backs in this list. That, uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, they're, they're all full backs. Uh, 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 Alan Kernigan. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was uh, Terry Phelan you played with 91 times at City. Yeah. Um, and then Andy Hill 85 times, yeah. uh, and then Michel Vonk 73 times. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, uh, add it with uh, Alan Kernigan. Uh, a good defender just came from Middlesbrough, uh, and I'd had an un- understanding with Michael Vonk um, uh, how I played, how we played offside. This was back in the day when you could just catch people offside by, uh, uh, and it's one of those. I'd have to give Alan Kernigan the signal, and he wouldn't do it. <laughs> uh, and I'm right, so I'm pushing up, playing offside, and, and he's dropping off. So that relationship didn't last long until we had, we had to have a sit down and have a conversation. But Alan, so if, if I give you the signal, no is the only thing that cancels it, but then you've got to tell me. Otherwise, it looks like we're not on the same page. Yeah. In the end, it was one of I knew then very quickly, I picked up. Alan wasn't comfortable playing offside. Yeah. So then you have to, I have to change my change game and say, yeah. right, now, now, now we defend deep then. Mm. Or I'll go and win the header, which well, that wasn't my strong point winning. I wanted to go for second ball. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, N- Nadam, do you know the players you played alongside the most in the defence? Um, Richard Dunn? Yeah, uh, 86 times. Uh, wouldn't have been company. Uh, I can't think who was. Uh, Micah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 47 times. Yeah. Uh, Sylvan Dissan. Yeah, Dissan. It's, it's not a bad three, is it? Yeah, it's a good, a good trio. That's it's not a bad four. Do you know what Keith was saying as well? Like, every defender is kind of different, but when you find someone that's on the same wavelength yeah. as you, like, it's great to be out there. Mm. But then I think for that City game yesterday, you've got obviously Diaz and Stones, but it's also the fact Edison's there as well. You know what I mean? Like, that's those three play the ball to each other more than any other say when those two are at the back they know that if they're aggressive Edison's sweeping up behind yeah. if you find a goalie who doesn't come off his line and the manager <coughs> tells him to be aggressive <coughs> my friend <laughs> that's stress that's that's hell on earth that honestly hell on earth but the the relationships are fantastic and i think best of all with that city side i never really pay attention to this until i hear someone talk about it from externally the really big side and an aggressive side. Yeah. And they'll either there, pass you to death or kick you into Rosette. There, there was a point in the second half yesterday when Arsenal had had they'd had a, a, a spell of possession, but it was all on the halfway line. Yeah. And then suddenly I looked up and Diaz was on the halfway line. And I'm like, why are you there? That's, like that's you, you are do. you are pressing so high up there. Yeah, it's because yeah, they know that the balance is there. Yeah. Both will never go. One will go when it's the right time to go. But they understand like to, to tactically understand what you have to do to sort of have the mentality to be able to do it as well and understand why you're doing yeah. it. And then to continue to do it, even if it makes you uncomfortable, because Ruben Diaz isn't the quickest player in the City side, no. but he's not concerned about what's going on behind him because he knows that the right thing to do is to step forward yeah. and you've got cover behind you, yeah. whereas other people, because they're worried about their pace, will take a step back. But that step back is what affects everybody else. Yeah. If the manager wants you to take a step forward, go forward, that's it. You know when you, know when you watch the City play out and you get, you get a lot of teams and they, you can tell that they focus on playing out, breaking lines... Uh, getting people arriving in pockets mm. but the thing that I notice about City is it's not the negative to go back to Edison Yeah, it's a reset Yeah, which means yeah. and as soon as the ball goes back there that it's like a trigger yeah. to reset reset your shape and put uh, put the, uh, the onus on the opposition how are you going to stop us again where you get a lot of teams they see it as a negative going back to the goalkeeper it's not 
Mm. Uh, that, that's a, it's most, a reset. Most of the goalkeepers, though, are like me, and they they they, they have two thoughts in the mind, <laughs> yeah. and it's generally, oh god, I've got the ball at my feet. What am I going to do with it now? Yeah. Edison is just yeah. like there's the, the, just cool, calm, I, and oh. I never I had never thought I'd be watching a game of football where the goalkeeper can put his foot on top of it and just <laughs> wait there for someone to come out. Yeah. But it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, and let them get really close. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, not stress at all. Yeah. And best of all. Everyone else around the field is staying in the positions that they know is right because they know the ball can get to them. Yep. Back in my time, you see the goalkeeper under a bit of pressure and you're sort of reacting to it, thinking maybe what's the worst thing that could happen here? Yeah. But instead for City, it's like... I trust like, him, yeah. Yeah, they trust him. They trust everyone on the field. They trust him to make the right decisions. Yeah. Even the balls which they play to like Rodri or Gundogan where they've got two people pressing them. On the field, it feels like there's danger. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like it's just a it's like a it's passing a, drill for those guys. But it's a it's a it's a kind of like a false danger, isn't it? Because the point is to make the sure that when you see like Ruben Diaz for for instance had a had a spell where he just had his foot on top of the ball yeah. and was almost saying to Odegaard, "Well, yeah, just come, come on, come on, yeah. come and come and get this." Yeah. And then as soon as he as soon as he makes the run, he goes, "No, no, no I'm, I'm just going to knock it round here." And then Gundogan's got it, and and yeah. City are in. It's almost like that that false danger where City know that they are in control of the situation and they want the opponents to go. We can have this. We can get. We can get it off you. That is that, that how many times do you, you thinking? It seems like City have got an extra player. Mm. Whichever side of the pitch is on, you're thinking, like, well, I, I don't know on this side. I that's I Edison, though, isn't yeah. it? That's that's the role. That, the fact Sometimes. that he's there. Yeah. Depend, for me, I think it depends whether they go with the two centre backs like they did yesterday, or they go with the back three. Yeah. If they go with the back three, they don't tend not to use Edison mm. as much. Yeah. But when would they go with the two? Then that's it. So yeah. th you can see three is the key number. Yeah. In terms of how they play and. To be honest, mate, it's, it's amazing. But to talk about detail, having played amateur football for the last year or so as well, the passes into midfield, there's so much detail that goes into it because they'll play the ball to the right side of the player that's going to be receiving it. Yeah. Safe side, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They're not just kicking the ball to them. There's so much detail in terms of the weight of it, the angle of it, and so on and yeah. so forth. Whereas I think most people don't realise that's a thing. But if that wasn't being done that way, then it doesn't make any sense you at all. You can't position it. your body this way. No, you can't, yeah. It's even that. It's, it's, it's the movement and the timing of that support run from the midfield player of when he comes. Because it's not always a straight run in it. And sometimes somebody that's in that area he vacates, and, but somebody else comes in there, yeah. and it's a, it's a set pass. You leave the ball in the space for somebody to come in, and then you get that rotation of play. Yeah. And then the next thing, two, three passes, they're out of there, yeah. and the, te the the opposition team's exposed. Yeah. And you're thinking, like, how has that happened? It's like creating a counter attack when you've got the ball. It's, invi it's, like, it's inviting mm. the press. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But you've got to be you've got to be a very good you've got to be a very brave coach and you've got to have very good players that, yeah. that believe in you and trust in you and understand it because when it works, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. It looks so simple. How would you have felt if uh, Guardiola had come into City and said, I want you to do this? Um um, I, I enjoyed the football. Yeah, I thought uh, I, thought I, I, I knew you'd say that. I, I, I was one of those defenders. I enjoyed the football. Um, no, um, I, don't, I don't think probably how I progressed through my career. I think I played in all the divisions, mm. uh, and I well, started out uh, as a right winger, so, so I could handle the football, and then having to become a defender and adopting a defensive mentality um, you're thinking I still like the football yeah. um, understand the, the other side of the game where you have to be competitive and you have to be a little bit aggressive at times but ultimately I still like the football um, would have I enjoyed a coach or did I probably the best coach that I had um, probably would have been as a, as a football coach would have been Colin Lee who I thought was very good uh, and excellent about the, the detail involved in uh, not only being being uh, a, a defender, but in playing the ball as in, well. Yeah, in playing the ball out and being constructive in being and building play from the back. Uh, I thought it was excellent. Whereas before, it was just cases like, like stop them from scoring, Keith, and that and, and <laughs> job done. Yeah, we'll deal. We'll deal with the rest after yeah, that. The, yeah, the, the, the game's changed completely now. Yeah, yeah. I know a, you'd be all right. I've no, seen you, no, I've no, seen no. you up close. No, no, no. Okay, let me let me try and explain that to people as well because some people will be uncomfortable with this. So. Professional footballers can pass a football. Yeah. Breaking news. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if a manager comes in and wants you to play more football, the, the, the next stage is like having the mentality to accept that and choosing to do it. Mm. But it's always easier when everyone else in the team is playing football as well. If one or two people on any side want to play football and others don't, it doesn't really work. Because yeah. say times um, yesterday when, say Kanji's playing left back and he's taking a touch because he's distinctly right-footed, he's got an option. And it's Ruben Diaz to yeah. stand at that point because he wants to receive the ball even though he's under pressure. And he's going to receive it and pass it to the next person that wants to receive it because they're under pressure, yeah? And for me personally, looking back at my career, one of the things I was bad at was things like hitting channel balls and long balls. 
I was like, so if I didn't have to do that, I feel like I'd be a better player. Yeah. And if you had players who wanted to receive it, like some of the best football I played was when all of a sudden you've got David Silva in front of you yeah. who will receive it under pressure. Yeah. There you go, David, please enjoy. Yeah. As opposed to the old, old city where you'd have the ball at your feet and you'd see a lot of numbers and hands in the air saying, <laughs> go yeah. over there, point that way, point yeah. that do, way. Do something with it down yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> then you play long ball, it doesn't work out. I was like, oh, God. Yeah. So, yeah, so like with Pep, I would love to get the chance to play in a system like this because I think he simplifies, even though it looks really complex, he simplifies it to a point. And you can tell by his coaching, because I thought it was so well drilled yesterday mm -hmm. that everyone knew exactly what they want to do. And I think as a player, that's one of the greatest feelings when you step on the pitch and you know exactly what the plan is. Yeah. And you know you're surrounded by people who will do it and stick to it. So as a consequence, you don't have to do anything out of the, out yeah. of the ordinary. Be aggressive, be supported and receive the ball and you'll find people to pass it to yeah. as well. You, you, yeah. you know what you mentioned there, channel, uh, the hitting the channel ball. Yeah. People don't see that as, um, or players nowadays don't see that as an art form. I mean, I've been at uh, Northampton, Oldham, mm. uh, and I've had players, defenders out, hitting channel balls yeah. and they can't do it. Yeah. But they, but they won't go out and practice it. You give them a bag of balls and put, you know, uh, this is the area that I want you to put the ball in. They don't see that as a skill. Yeah. And it is a skill. Yeah, that, that ball yeah. is, a, is a difficult ball to it hit. Really with, with, is, with, yeah. with the right pace, yeah. uh, the right trajectory. So, uh, so you're leaving the ball into a good area. But players nowadays, uh, they don't want to go and practice that. And they think it's a great, it's a great, uh, it's a great tool to have in your bag. Mm, and it's, uh, and with that as well, it's even better when you've got a striker that will chase it down. Oh. Because then it's like, how, <laughs> did you see the time, Again, I think I, know, I think I know what you're going to say. This is a city podcast, or whatever. We understand yeah. it. So Ruben Diaz just heads a ball yeah. down towards the corner. Yeah. Rob Holden's running down, but Harlan's chasing him. Yeah. So next thing, because Harlan's chasing him, Holden just kicks it out for yeah. a throw in. Yeah. See Harlan's does, reaction. Did he celebrate? A double fist pump. Yeah. That one. That, yeah. That, at times, for us, <laughs> when we talk about false nines, inverted fullbacks, all this stuff, yeah. sometimes just chase a ball down the yeah, channel. Yeah. Yeah. Territorial you know play. You'll is get the one. territory. Yeah. And that's what I, that's what I love the most about this city back line and city in general. They could have a thousand passes in a game or they could be doing that and putting you under pressure and making you uncomfortable. Yeah. And you see that's why they're the total package and why people seem to uh, both love them and hate them just as much. Yeah. yeah. Well, Nadam, you talked about Mamel Akanji. I want to bring in this uh, from uh, Johnny the Bakewell Blue who's emailed to say, um, I'm watching the Cup Semi and just wanted to ask if you think there's a better value for money signing anywhere this season than Manuel Akanji. We got him le for less than £20 million. He's strong, tall, great in the air, fast, skillful, and authoritative. Got to be a candidate for bargain of the season. Yeah, I would say so. I don't think there is an award for bargain of the season. Though. There isn't. No, but, we, I mean, yeah. we could create one. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> yeah, but he's, he, I think he's been great. I think he's exceeded a lot of people's expectations. You know, I knew him from watching him play for Dortmund. Mm. I'd seen him play for Switzerland, yeah. so I knew he was a good player. But after all those City players came back to fitness, you were thinking, well, maybe he's going to be out. Yeah. But the big point for me, the big turning point in terms of my expectations of him was when him and Ake played as centre-backs in the Manchester derby yeah. at home. Yeah. And you had Ruben Diaz and I think maybe like Laporte and stuff on the bench. And when for Pep to make that call in that game, which means as much to everyone associated with City, I thought, okay. There's trust there. There's yeah. some trust there. Yeah. And the performances have been have been fantastic. He's played right back, he's done left back, centre back, right of the three. But then, like I say, it's when you really take a step back, are we, we, we're stunned that a full Swiss international has done really well. <laughs> you know, like, what, what, we, what, what, we we expect, yeah, yeah. what, what are we talking about? Yeah, he's, like, got, yeah, he's got all the credentials, hasn't he? Um, as a natural defender, as a ball player, uh, he, he can defend as well. Yeah, um, exactly. But, but he can play ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, did, did either of you ever have to play out of position on the, on the wrong side? Because obviously he yeah. played left back. So I, 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 yeah. I played left back for England. Yeah, um, and, and I think I went to the went to the Euros, and I played right back. And so I, I was a centre back. Uh, made my name as a centre back, and then I think it was uh, Tony Dorigo uh, used to play for Leeds United. Uh, he not refused. He said he didn't want to play right back, uh, and I'm like uh, Graham Taylor coming to speak. And he said. But, uh, I'm going to play you, but you have got the option. Cause I'm, I'm going to play you at right back, but I understand if you don't want to play there. I'm like, not a chance. I will put that shirt on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> give me that shirt. I'll go and play left wing again. Mm. Uh, I don't mind. I will play anyway. So I think I played three times for England. I played left back, right back, and sweeper. 
Are you is, trying, you... is it is it hard making that switch? If you're on your wrong side, because I'm I am painfully right footed. So like, if I get a pass back on my left hand side, it's just it's potluck where it's going. Mm. So well, like, is it hard when you when you switch sides? Well, I play. I'm, well, I'm right footed. or well, I was right footed, but I always played left hand side centre back. Yeah. Um. So I always felt comfortable on the yeah. le- uh, on the left hand side, but then, um. But that was mainly because back in the day when you could squeeze play up, and I, I invited people to hit the channel ball because I could outpace centre forwards, and then I was going back and I was going on my right foot to pass yeah, the ball so back. So, so I always felt comfortable mm. um, and keeping. Uh, so uh, is it difficult? Yeah, it's, it's slightly different back in the day when it was because you hit more channel balls. Mm. You didn't have people come and get get the ball off of you. There wasn't yeah. a rotation in play. It was like you get it, you put it down into that area. Yeah, I think if he, if Akanji was to have been pressed from his right side to force him onto his left for 90 minutes. Yeah. It's different. It's different. Yeah. But when he can take a touch on his right foot and have the field open to know yeah. that Ruben Diaz is back there, to know there's a switch of play on his right side, like... You're basically playing into his strengths, and he basically played like a left side centre back. back. Yeah. He had a job which he did very well on Saka. Sometimes he ran forward and all that stuff, but he didn't play that game as a left back. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so yeah. as a consequence, it's visually different, but you know, it's, it's Fund- fundamentals are the same. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. yeah, essentially. We spend we spend a lot of time looking at Guardiola's lineup and going, well, he's actually playing like Bernardo left back or whatever. Yeah. He's, like, he's not actually left back. He's no. playing. He's, he's playing he's, in defence. He's position. named yeah. as a left back, but it's <laughs> not. Can yeah. I can I get can I make a point here actually? So uh, tell me what you think about this. So before the game, the lineups came out, and if you look, the lineup had John Stones in midfield. Are you somebody that believes a lineup on a screen is how you play in possession or how you defend? Well, that's a good question. I because I only ever I, I never look at it in formation, and I, because I got stung by looking at the BBC earlier this season, mm. and it it just it like listed De Bruyne at centre half because yeah. of how just of, of the players on the on the graphic. Um, but when I see a, when I see a lineup as like a list of names, I I picture it in my head as that's how they're going to stand at kickoff. So that's the thing for you where to stand yeah. at kickoff, okay? And that's yeah. with kickoff or without it. Because again, that's a different. That's different as well, and I don't know the answer to that. So sometimes it's. Uh, I've done it before. Sometimes when I've gone, uh, when I've switched from a three to a four, but when we get the kickoff, yeah, we line up as a four. So the opposition manager will look at his oh, well, they're, they're playing with a four, and then that's <laughs> it. takes them ten minutes to realise. Ah, gotcha. They're, they're, yeah. they're playing with a three. Yeah. Or you're playing one up. They're playing two up. Or you're playing three up. Mm. Um, so yeah, um, within the flow of the game, it works itself out. But yeah. in the beginning, your mindset can change. Oh, they're playing two up top. Yeah, it's uh, it's more so just for the John Stones thing because whenever he's been. In the team in the last say like couple of months people for like ESPN and stuff they'll ask me like what's the formation here and they say is it like a 3-2 at the back yeah. I'm like well, no not really because John Stones <laughs> isn't he's not a midfielder no. and when they're defending he's not defending from there mm. he's in the back four yeah so that makes me think he's like which does it is it a case of whether you want to be progressive or otherwise but when you if you saw that sort of formation lineup and it said here's the three and John Stones is there next to Rodri do you perceive John Stones being a midfielder in that game, or would you see him as a defender going into midfield? I'd see him as a defender going into midfield. So it's a back four, then, isn't it? Yeah. 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 But, it's, a, but it's, a, it's, it's this situation of back four out possession, back three in possession. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what any of that means. It's just like it's, it's, it's just concepts <laughs> just, yeah, now, isn't it? It's, it's a nightmare like, to play against. It would be a nightmare. Yeah, like yeah. who's going to pick up the the centre back that's now playing in the eight? I, 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 don't, know. I don't know. You take it. Yeah. Yours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your man. Yeah, yeah. You figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking of nightmares to play against, uh, let's talk about Erling Haaland. Uh, he needs one more Premier League goal to equal the best ever golden boot tally over a 42-game season. Mm. Uh, he's in a 38-game season, then we've not hit 38 games yet. Uh, he scored 33 Premier League goals from 53 shots on target. So he scored more goals from his shots on target than he's missed. Mm. And uh, 102 shots in total. That's about a goal every third shot. Um, and I did a bit of maths, and I tallied up your career goals oh, between. Here we go. Here we go. Here and... we go. Did you invite us on to do this? <laughs> did you, uh, how many shots I, did I? Have? I accept that you that you were both defenders. Um, you scored fifty six between you, so he's not far off. Yeah, your... mostly Keith. So. <laughs> uh, mostly Keith. Yeah, yeah I'll, mine, I'll, I'll were, mine were penalties. <laughs> right. Okay. But still, yeah, I mean, you still got to score them. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Um, uh, we've talked about City adapting to Haaland and Haaland adapting to City. Where do you see that now at the moment, Keith? Because, I mean, last night was probably as close to, to perfection as you can probably get from him fitting into a City system, I guess, so far. Yeah, yeah apart, apart from that, I think he'd probably be disappointed with the chances that he had last night that he uh, didn't get more goals. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah literally. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, th- I think it's... Um, th- 
he seamlessly fitted in. I think everybody was saying that, like, that the success that City had before with playing without a centre forward, then would they be able to adapt then to play to play with a centre forward? And you've got to say that he has seamlessly fitted into that. That mm. you think he's been there mm. years, and the, the understanding that he's got with good players around him. Um, He's he's been there what seven eight months and he knows where De Bruyne is going to run and De Bruyne knows where he's running yeah. and it's like that doesn't that that surely can't just come that instantly. No, again, I think I think sometimes people don't give the credit that uh, that Pep will uh, will be the work that he will be doing on the training ground because it doesn't it doesn't just happen. Mm. If I'm the, mind you, De Bruyne is excellent as a coach. You say about uh, a number ten, you want a number ten to arrive in those areas as number ten. Don't stand in the areas because you're easier to mark. When, yeah. you work, when you leave that area for you to go and work in, phenomenal. But, mm. but that takes... When you have a look at De Bruyne, uh, most people in coaching, you say, like, know your next pass. Yeah. He, he knows the next passages of play. So he knows he's going to go there, there, there. Now I need to be in that area there. And his time and his movement, how he arrives in the areas, phenomenal. Yeah. And then having that link then and understanding what other players are going to be doing, need to be doing, and what support they're going to, uh, going to do. It's phenomenal. Like, I, I love watching De Bruyne play because he plays at, at his pace, mm. but, but he has got a turn of pace as oh, well. Oh, yes, yeah. But, he, but he's one of those players that looks, he's got always got time. Yeah. Always got time in, in critical areas as well. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I was trying to work out from that opening goal, like how he squeezed that in, and all, all I can come up with is that it's just a phenomenally well placed shot. Because yeah. I don't think Rob Holding does that much wrong, and like he's bent it round him from twenty three, twenty four yards. Was that Gabriel? I think it might have been Gabriel. Yeah. Um, with that goal, from where I was sitting, I thought it must have taken a deflection for someone to yeah. go to that side. Yeah. But that's the skill of the man because nobody's going to shoot to that near side. Yeah. So I imagine Ramsdale probably thought to himself as well that it has to be going the other way. Uh, but the pinpoint finish to go in there. That's... I must admit, like, when I first saw it, I thought it was um, I thought Ramsdale will think he could. Uh, it'd be disappointing. Yeah. I think. I think. I think. Top goalkeeper. Yeah, it's Ramsdale made so many saves. You, I think. Did you I know... name another goalkeeper then? No, no. Because I meant Ramsdale. Yeah. If I, no, if I didn't no, say Ramsdale, you said you're talking about holding. Holding. Yeah, I meant yeah, Ramsdale. Yeah, I, was thinking, yeah, I, was, yeah, I was. I was seeing Ramsdale. We knew what you were on about. Yeah, yeah. I think. It's a different type of finish, yeah. you know. Most people wouldn't shoot from that distance no. to put it in there. Mm. And I think that's maybe what's throwing him off because nine times out of ten, people are going to try and go across him or kick it really hard. Yeah. But the placement, it's like, it's magnificent. Yeah. I think, yeah, as well, like, we can't be too hard on Ramsdale. I think he was the only player that played well for Arsenal yesterday. Yeah. Because if, and that's after conceding four, yeah. which says a lot about the game itself. But, you know, you talked about the link-up between those two. I remember being at the, um, the Community Shield <laughs> Listen to all that noise that came afterwards. Oh, Holland's going to be a failure. De Bruyne's this and timing's you don't, off. You don't and... get the, the, the loose touches. You don't get that sort of time in the Premier League. All <laughs> that noise. Yeah. Talk about like an industry of overreaction. There was so much noise. But then these guys, like, you know, we've seen them play probably 40 games together. But think how many times they've trained together. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the relationships that some of these players have is not just something that comes out at three o'clock on a Saturday. There's a lot of work that goes in off the, behind the scenes as well. And that connection's there. And it's not just, you know, Harlan that's giving it to De Bruyne. It, you know, it's Grealish, it's Bernardo, it's Mahrez, it's Foden, it's Gundogan looking for him as well. And then when Kevin De Bruyne gets the ball, if I was playing up front, I'd be making a running behind yeah. as well. Because lo and behold, <laughs> you, you're, you're probably going to get it. Yeah. Your feet. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's class. Like, I, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit biased. I've got a soft spot. I love Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the fact that we've got a 22 year old up front who is brilliant now and will only get better as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how would I like either of you are named in the opposition team? You've got Haaland up against you. What do you do? Drop off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pull, no. pull, pull your hamstring or something no. like that. You, you drop off and play narrow, and you get everybody else around you. Yeah. yeah. You can't. You can't allow the game to be one that's played to his strengths. No. So if you're going to enter into a foot race with him, like he's exceedingly fast and he's massive. You know yeah. what I mean? This guy's six four. Yeah. You beat him. In a race, yeah. yeah, I'm quicker than him. I know, what, yeah, I'm quicker. But like, what difference does it make when he's flipping, got his elbow just right in my <laughs> in my throat, just running running past? Because you know, but he plays on the shoulder as well, doesn't he? Striker, and this is the downside I think of defending is that you're always reactive to what they're doing. Yeah. Whereas the attacker knows the right time to run and things like this. So yeah. there's never really a race where you go to a gun. You're just always chasing somebody else, and he's he's magnificent. And worse though, it's the service that he gets. His little innate sense of where to be. Yeah. And the fact he can just finish from anywhere, like, it's, I don't know, it's not normal. It's not normal to have something like that up front. <laughs> Again, just touching on that, I don't think you defend against him as an individual. No, you can't. Uh, you have to you defend uh, as a unit, which means then you have to defend narrow. Yeah. 
it, that's, that's why I think, in my opinion, City struggle the most against back fives and stuff like yeah. that. And it's not, when I say struggle, it's relative. It's yeah. very, very, very much relative. They tend to beat them, but it's hard work. Yeah, yeah, exactly, because they'll always have tons of bodies in there. And for Haaland, for as good as his movement is, you might beat one, beat one person, but then there's somebody else there yeah. as well. Yeah. And vice versa for like De Bruyne. They're trying to find those areas, but the space is less. Mm -hmm. So there's a greater emphasis on the wide men. But in games like yesterday, where they can go and just like dominate you centrally, that's, yeah. that's hell on earth. Yeah. Uh, Sheffield United did it well. Um, in, in, to start, yeah, uh, they did. Yeah, to start with, yeah. with a back five, and then they had the, the two wide midfield players out of possession. They went and sat in that hole to, to deny the number 10s. Mm. And, uh, and again, it, they needed a penalty exactly, to, to, to break to their deadlock. Going, yeah. um, if they got to half time, it could have been a different game again. And then you have to see a different side of the city when you're saying. Go, uh, could go break them down. Yeah, yeah. The, the only weakness that you see is City being countered yeah. on. Um, teams don't have enough possession against them. Um, but you can think of uh, probably a few teams that if you're going to cause uh, Man City a problem, it's going to be on the counter-attack because mm, you're not yeah. going to dominate them with the ball. It's a high-risk yeah. high strategy, though, sitting deep well, defending the, the 18, though, because you concede and like what, what comes next after that? Is, is it high-risk? Well, OK, it's... Um, I don't know. I don't know what the. I don't know what the opposite of risk is. That it, is a think, reward. I think it's. I think it's a way to stay in the game for longer. Yeah. yeah. Because as you saw with Arsenal yesterday, there were times when people get frustrated and go and try to do the press. Yeah. And they do it by themselves. Yeah. But then that's a bigger risk because then it opens up a space yeah. for someone else to go and like go and attack you. Yeah. Whereas if you've got the bodies in there, it's quite negative. But I remember at the semi-final, Kyle Walker made it into the box. He was about to put a cross in, and I saw eight Sheffield United shirts. Mm. Yeah. That doesn't feel like risk to me, <laughs> you know. That feels like a level of security, which um, you know, to a certain extent, you'd need if you were a heavy underdog against them. But as Keith was saying, if you have an out ball, then you know, before you know it, you can just hoof one long. Somebody can win somebody a free kick. Someone it, can get yeah. in behind, and that can be supported because, say, the the game that City deserved to lose the most, I think, this season was the one against Brentford. It's because Ivan Tony basically put on a masterclass and there were other players who were running up there with him yeah. and they played with the back five yeah. defended how they defended but then boom there's the danger like you remember the point when it was De Bruyne versus three with yeah. like five minutes to go like that's a team that, that's not high risk for them to be still having five players back but they know that they've got the right setup to go and try and do something the other way and as a consequence I'd say that's the best plan for them yeah um, let's touch on Riyad Mahrez as well because um, we not really covered the FA Cup semi-final but he did score a hat-trick in there as um, you do yeah, as, as, as you do yeah. just, just pop up in the semi-final with a hat-trick um, it's hard isn't it for Guardiola because Mahrez is a, a fantastic player who's contributing so much and then you look at the team on Wednesday night and you go he probably deserves a place in there but the plan that Pep's come up with, it kind of like that he doesn't fit into that plan for that game, and it's just like it's one of those things where you got to put your arm around a player and just go, look, I'm really sorry to do this, but you you scored a hat trick and you ain't playing. <laughs> Again, I think that's uh, management you know, when you have to make the decisions, but you don't make them for the individuals, you make them for the betterment of the team and your game plan. So Pep would have probably ideally had his game plan, his team selected uh, for the Arsenal game before the semi-final game, regardless of the result. Um, but it is difficult when you've got a player that's you know just scored a hat-trick, got you to the final of the cup, and then you've got to have that conversation when you're not playing. But again, but that's about creating the environment mm. whereby players understand, manager picks a team for a reason and then that's when you get that that squad mentality that yeah I'm not playing this week but I've need, I know I need to be ready because I might because be the week after yeah, yeah. I might be starting and, uh, and keeping people on board uh, it is a skill that man, man, uh, that man management skill about, uh, of having that dialogue with players that, and creating that squad mentality it's easy to say oh you have a squad of 26, 27 players but to keep everybody involved to keep everybody on their toes and you can't just rotate players for the sake of it there's got to be you've got to be mm. winning games mm. um, so, so again that's, uh, that's the, the, the side of management that a lot of people don't understand maintaining that environment yeah crucial is that rotation and that kind of that squad management through the season is that the reason why City are now firing all cylinders Naden? Um I'm sure it potentially plays into it but as Keith was saying like the manager picks the best team for any particular game mm. you know if it meant that it was going to be the same 11 for 10 games in a row I think he would have done that so I wouldn't necessarily say they would have been rotating at that point because say as we look back there's certain players first who haven't been rotated Rodri hasn't been rotated you know what I mean Haaland right. essentially hasn't been rotated yeah. So we can't really say it's like full rotation. Yeah. But there have been other players who haven't played for a spell, but there's tended to be a reason for that. Say when you look at, say when De Bruyne wasn't playing well for a bit, he wasn't really in the team as much. You know, there were some people who were very, being very critical of his performances, 
The usual. Remember, remember the headlines in February being uh, how how a city not playing a player like De Bruyne. It's like have you have you watched him recently? He's not. Yeah. He's just not firing. He wasn't. And there, there could be a million different reasons happens, for that. Yeah. yeah, there could be so many different reasons for that. And there've been other players as well. And as I say, we, we class it as rotation. He makes three or four changes for every game. But it's not just a case of rotation for the sake of it. I think the point that you made and Keith made about how it's the right player for the right moment yeah. in the right game, that's quite significant. Because then come the end of the season, maybe it looks like you know certain people have been rotated to build them into this spot, but it's not been that. Mm. And I think it's a privilege to have Bernardo, Mares, uh, Foden, who can all play on that side. Who are all three completely different players, yeah. but can help you win a game in three completely different ways. You know that's that's amazing. And and, you, I, I guess if you're the opposition, you look at that and you don't know which one of them they're going to pick. No. You don't know how they're going to attack. Yeah, you. but uh, to, to comment on something which uh, Guardiola said after the FA Cup semi, he said he's got a really good relationship with Riyad, and Riyad always lets him know when he's disappointed that he's not playing. And he said he really likes Riyad because he's got an amateur spirit. Yeah. The amateur spirit is the idea of how he just wants to play football. Mm. He has a football in his house. He plays football in his house. He'll be keeping doing head tennis, all this stuff. Those people who just really love the game, I think you need those in a squad because when you play 60 games a season, it can turn into just business, just games, just so on and so forth. But that true love for just being on the ball and doing whatever, like credit to him for that. Because I'll be honest, towards the end of my career, I didn't have that. Mm. I had like the 15 year professional mindset, like Mm. we've got a game. I have to do this, I have to do that. I have to be ready for it. But... Yeah, I have to be ready. Amara's, you know, he'll understand that he has to be ready. But his sense of excitement about just being out on the training pitch, having the ball at his feet. Maybe it's because he's an attacker. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? How much is spirit for defenders? Like, oh, let's work on some channel walls today. You know what I mean? Let's block some shots. But yeah, they're, they're magnificent. And also, it then means we give a lot more credit to Jack Grealish. Yeah. Because he doesn't really get rotated. And it's because he maybe he's got a mix of all the things that all those guys on the other side have. Because he's got it in abundance. Because it's for, I don't think he did that much yesterday in the game. He did a lot off the ball, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, and but was... did, did you notice really his, his discipline within the game plan yes. of keeping his shape? Yeah. Whereas before, when he was at Villa, if he, he wasn't getting if, wanted, he, if yeah. he wasn't getting the ball, he would go, go wandering and, yeah. and he would go and find it and disrupt this. And I think that's where Jack's maturing as a player and, and gaining that understanding of being involved in the squad and what his job is. Mm. His job yesterday was mainly. Got to stay wide. You've got to keep our shape. You've got to give us that out ball. But if we need to switch, play quickly. But again, that's that understanding. There was, yeah. game. there was another job in there, which the seems to be oh, well, 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 it seems to be wind up the Arsenal players <laughs> as soon as you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I'm, 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 and he made it. He did a def- good defensive play as well in the first half yeah. with Kanji. Yeah, yeah, with Kanji and Saka. Yeah, that, and he's done that a few times in recent that, that, recent that, that, times. I think it was in the first half where I saw him sprinting. But he must have had a 70, 75 yard sprint yeah. Yeah, to get back into a defensive position. I'm thinking, wow. That's yeah, somebody yeah. that wants to. I wish I had somebody like that in front of me. <laughs> that, 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 that's a player that's buying in. Yeah, um, 100%. Which is what you need. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's have a look ahead now because uh, City play uh, Fulham and West Ham this week. Um, we talked a bit earlier on about it all being about focus now and, and, and being ready for these games. Um, equally, mentally, how key would it be to go back to the top of the table this weekend? Because Chel- Chelsea don't play till Tuesday. You mean Arsenal? Arsenal, Arsenal don't play Chelsea. till Tuesday. Arsenal hey. Chelsea. Are you projecting here? Yes. Yes. Uh, like I gathered you would be. <laughs> I would like to go back to the top yeah, of the table. Yeah, that's what I mean. How good would it be for me yeah. as a fan of City to see them at the top of the table? Top of the table, game in hand, yeah. sit back, relax. I don't know. They could touch the top of the table, but then they could be off it by Tuesday night as well. Yeah. Um, but I think they understand, and this is what makes them so great, that it's not about like doing half a job. It's about doing the whole thing. You know, They know that if they win their games between now and the end of the season, they could finish up. It's like with it being an historic season. Yeah. But if they lose a game, changes everything again. Yeah. If they drop points, changes everything again. And they're playing against teams who've got their own sort of like agendas and stuff which they want to f- complete themselves. So, you know, they they might have, you know, a day off today because they're playing on Sunday, aren't they? Chance to reset. But that Arsenal game is three points just like the game on the weekend. It's, you don't get extras for beating a game against Arsenal. So I You think... do deny them the chance to make up ground on you though. Half beaten Arsenal. Yeah. Yeah, but then what use is that if they drop points on the weekend? Because before you know it, it's the, the race changes again. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then in the space of... So I've loved this last week because everything's fallen favourably for City. They beat Bayern. Uh, they won in the semi-final. Yeah. They beat Arsenal. Three different games and three different competitions. Three wins that provide a big boost for this final stage of the season with a basically a month to go. But they still have to do things and get things to happen. And it'd be the... 
like Arsenal dropped points against three sides before this who we wouldn't expect them to. People believe City won't do that because for years they could take the three points off everyone. It's not just the case of the ones against their rivals. So they'll go there. It'll be a game which they'll be more uncomfortable in because it's all the Fulham fans being there. Mm. But if they play anywhere near their potential, then they'll be okay. But they still have to get themselves up to near their potential because the Premier League's a far different outfit to say playing Sheffield United, who in some ways maybe we're just happy to be in that semi final. Yeah, I mean, just looking at the competitions as a whole as well, Keith. Um, it's it, 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 there is an element of a balancing act now between the Premier League because the Champions League draw Real Madrid. It's like that, that's there's a lot from last season to unpack there. It's a tough challenge as well, and then you've got a Manchester Derby FA Cup final. Yeah, I, kinda, I think this is uh, the the demands that the manager and the consistency of those demands that the manager puts on the squad. Um, because uh, will he be set, will he be settling now for? Well, yeah, well, like I said we uh, won the semi final, uh, be, uh, did, did well in the uh, uh, the Champions League, beat Arsenal. Uh, he, that will not lessen his demands that he puts on those players. Will he expect, or will he have any expect, expectations of those players coming in and be uh, and having a down day? No, oh, it's a focus group. Very much so, maintaining that focus of winning the next game. That, you know, that winning mentality. The winning mentality is not just about the, having the ability to win games. Uh, it's doing what needs to be done yeah. in the lead up, uh, mentally, physically, your preparation to go out and perform. Being able to perform gives you the opportunity to be a winner. If you don't, if you don't set yourself targets um, and prepare properly, yeah, then you, you can't win games consistently. Uh, Man City will and do win games consistently, and that's because of the preparation, the mental approach that Pep has on that group, on yeah. his group. When you go in and you're a player at Man City, uh, you've got expectations and you do what needs to be done. And if you don't buy in, you're yeah. not there. Yeah, Very, very simple. You and don't play. Yeah, for sure. And I think Pep is obviously a big driver in that and the staff around him, but then the players have been there for a long time as well. Yeah. You know, So they've appreciated these big games towards the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And it would be a huge surprise to me if all of a sudden they're celebrating the game against Arsenal like that's the final game of the season. Mm -hmm. Like they know the bigger pitch and what it takes because very quickly, like they've been involved in times where they've been miles ahead, times where they've been doing the chasing, yeah. but they know it's not over until it's over. Yeah. You know, so as a consequence, the manager could say this is how it has to be. But I think other players will be saying it as well yeah. because they've done it so many times now. Yeah. yeah. As players, do you live for those games? Are the, are the, are the, <laughs> I'd love the, to. The, yeah. the, the pressure games yeah. where you have to win. I'll be honest. So yesterday's game was the first game which I just went to casually. Yeah. And I'd had a buzz about that game for two days prior. Yeah. And the last time I felt that was when I was playing in big games myself. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Because you're sort of looking, counting down as a sense yeah. of excitement and... You know, the crowd were up for it. They had the big banners and so on. You know that everybody's watching that game of football. Yeah. That's awesome. Because essentially, it's 22 players on a field, which can happen down the road in Salford somewhere. Yeah. But all of a sudden, you see the real big fact that this game, even though it's four, three points, it's a key one in terms of Pete and audience. And I, that, for me... Going in, it's the two best teams in England yeah, so far this season. It's the best. The rush, for me, of a big game is so high. That's why some of the best games I ever played were the biggest games yeah. because you have to find something more because the test is so much different so much harder yeah. you know and you understand the level of importance so it's basically like a cup final it's not a cup final yeah. yeah, you know and people dream of doing that like if you're playing in the end towards the end of the season and nothing matters yeah you not going through the motions, but when you're playing for something at you the end of the season, is that, is that what, nah, <laughs> you never, you never, you never phone it in. But like those seasons are a lot harder to remember. I, I think it's a, you know uh, the fear factor in football. Mm. Yeah, you know when you get you get some players can't handle that fear factor. Yeah, it's true. Some players thrive in it. A lot of fans I, I, can't it, handle it either. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I must admit, I was looking at the game yesterday, uh, and I had um, I was ninety percent confident. But at that ten percent doubt, I'm thinking if Arsenal turn up, um, could it be a draw? Could it? Could uh, could they sneak a one nil? Yeah. So that 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 ten percent uh, hesitancy. But I enjoy that. But that's that fear that's factor. For. Yeah. Yeah. Some players can't handle that fear factor because mm. yeah, you get somebody like well, we're guaranteed to go and win. You get that overconfident, and then they can't handle them when they go one nil down. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes you need to be able to operate in 90, 95 percent. But some players can't handle that fear factor. Yeah. Some managers. Can't, I know a lot of managers and coaches, they love Monday to Friday. Yeah, the yeah. coaching, but then Saturday, yeah. they don't enjoy game day. Yeah. Where 
I was completely different. Well, I am completely different as a coach. I love match days. I love the thrill and the buzz of match day, of yeah. winning, competing, yeah. on, uh, and solving problems on a match day when the team comes out. They've got, they're playing against a different team, a different formation, different players that have been playing, and then you think, right, now we need to work this out, chaps. Yeah. What I would say in regards to that as well, sort of make it relatable to fans, is that in all the run-ins that they've seen from City, they always remember the biggest games. Yeah. You know, you can't necessarily remember the ones before or after. Do you get nervous these days ahead of big games? Because I, as a, I, as a fan, as a fan. Um, it's different. I think because I have to work in the media, there's a sense of not necessarily anxiety around it, but like a real wish, wish for it to be positive. Yeah. Because if it's not positive, I know how... I'm going to be sort of treated in the media from that standpoint. Yeah. Almost as if I've played in the game myself yeah. and you're going to be blasted for what something else that's happened. That like you've got no control over. Yeah. yeah. But cuz I, I only asked cuz I had a I had a reset in how I thought last season. I'm sounding like a hippie now, I know, but I I completely changed my line of thinking where I used to get really nervous in the running ahead of big games. And I discovered it was because I was asking the question what if we lose? Where the actual question is what if we win? Yeah. Um I think that is not typical city. What's going on in your mind? Yeah. So maybe you are a hippie. Because <laughs> you, know, you can't help but always think about the worst case scenario. Like even yesterday, it goes 3 1, it's the 86 minute. Even myself, I was looking at the clock. <laughs> and why were there groans when the five minute board went up? Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I, I did say at that point, though, you know what? Point still keeps it in our hands. That's what I mean. So that's the typical city thing that exists in people's minds. And like the, the city have battered them for like 86 minutes. And it's like, oh, oh, flipping heck. Have you ever heard that expression, negativity courts company? Yeah. 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 And that's what it is. That's 55,000 people yeah, yeah, in a stadium yeah. bowl. Is it? Yeah. No, it couldn't, could it? Yeah. You get, you get drawn in, you get drawn in, you can't, you can't help but think about that. So I, I like, it's not nervousness. In fact, no, maybe it is because. Like when you're playing and you're in a squad, like there's a big difference between being on the bench for a big game, and being on the field. Yeah. On the field, as soon as the game starts, you're not nervous. Yeah. You're just playing a game of football. Yeah. When you're on the side, when you can't affect it, you can't affect it, and you're seeing it, and right. you know it affects you in the biggest scale. Like it doesn't feel the same. The game feels more intense. Feels like everything's going on. Feels like you're under more pressure. Like I was lucky yesterday because I was sitting higher, so I could see the game fully for what it was. Right. Whereas usually I'm a bit lower, so it feels like oh, right. this is good, that's good, but. Yeah, it was more at ease because I could see it fully. But like that nervousness, it sort of brings out the best in you. I think it brings yeah, out yeah. the best in the fans, brings out the best in the players, and brings those moments together whereby, as I say, you're, people at City remember that performance and that result between now and the end of the season, same way they might do if they beat Real Madrid in the semi final. Yeah, yeah, but I if mean, you if you have a cut and dry two 0 at Fulham this weekend, it's like okay, job done. Yeah. But it's exactly, not going to stick yeah. in the memory. Exactly. I think it's, it's embracing those nerves. Hmm. You get some people they fall apart with it. You've got to be able to embrace. Like, you're bound to be nervous. There's nothing wrong yeah. with being nervous. Like yeah. I say it before games. Now you walk into the changing room and you know it's a big game for the team. And then you ask the players and you say like, "Are you nervous?" And they think, "Oh, what do I need to say?" The manager just asks me, "I'm being." They say, "No." And then I tell them, yeah. "I am." Yeah, yeah. Stop, stop lying. To <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, there's nothing wrong with being nervous. Yeah. One of that. I played some of my best games when I was nervous. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it shows that you're keen to do well. Yeah, you know what I mean. Because you're nervous you about can. it, you're you not can. playing well, yeah. not going well. But yeah. when you're nervous, like this is the thing. Even if it's like transfer it to a different sports. Like people get nervous on the first tee and like playing a local like golf course. Yeah. Like it's not that deep, mate. But like you really <laughs> want to play well. Yeah. So that's why the anxiety sort of kicks do, in. Do you play think. golf? I do, yeah. Do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I think we need to have a game. What do you play off? I, uh well, I play off about ten. I just recorded a YouTube golf thing which will be coming out yeah. soon. Yeah. This afternoon this morning. And I played well to be first. So, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. you'd be uh, careful what you wish for. Yeah, no, no, I, I, <laughs> I, I played, I played yesterday at Presbury Golf Club. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, oh, there, I want to know the outcome there, there, to this. There, now. There's an invitation there. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Happily yeah, go. We have yeah. to set this up. <laughs> um, before we move on, uh, we got the charity bet coming up. Um, so let's have uh, some score predictions from each of you for uh, first off the Fulham away game. What you got for Keith? Two 0 Two 0 City. Uh, three one City. Three one City. That leaves me with not many options, but I will. I I will say two one City. A little bit tighter. Um, okay. And then uh, West Ham at home as well, Keith. Uh, I know David Moore. I used to play with David. Um, he will set his team up to be very competitive, um, but I, I think uh, he'll have the door opened, and I think it could be four. four. Really? Four nil. Four one. Four, four two. Nil. Four nil. Four nil. I'm going to say two one. 2-1. Yeah. Oh, I'll take 3-1 then. In okay. Do you know why I say 1 all the time? Because if... It, I know why. Because I do it as well. 
where so take like this game I've said 3-1 if West Ham opened the scoring in the first minute you're still in with a chance I'm not out of the game yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> is that a thing, is that a thing you've you're always in with a chance even when something bad yeah. happens yeah. always always hedge your bets that's, exactly, that's, that's yeah. my advice exactly. uh, remember you've got to be 18 or over to gamble prices can change and uh, for more information on responsible gambling take a look at begambleaware.org I'm uh, going to finish with uh, we've asked for, for a few questions for you both for uh, to finish so uh, Steve O'Brien on the email says on penalties this new way of watching the keeper move and then calmly slotting it the other way does anyone on the panel remember anybody doing this prior to Mario with us? I wondered if it was, if Alano did it. Um... No, Alano didn't do it. He used to take a slow run up, but then just smash it into the corner yeah. um, until he, I think he smashed about four into the corner, and I think we were like a bolt and away. And the keeper thought he was going to smash it in the same corner. He rolled it one mile an hour the other <laughs> side. I was like, he's, he's, he'll make it, this fella. He'll make it, yeah. yeah. But I've seen more people do it recently, and it's a good skill, to be fair. Yeah. And Keith, you took penalties. Um, mm. What do you make of it? Just get up there and smash it, or? Um, I'll just quickly recap. Uh, what, uh, we were one nil down. Old Trafford. Uh, Terry Feeling. I think it was Terry Feeling got sent off. Um, we get a penalty, so I put the ball down, and I mentally had this routine in my head of what I'm doing, and then I made the fatal mistake of looking up and seeing Peter Smichael, and I thought, <laughs> "You look big. Mm. Uh, you look very big." And so I put the ball down, walked back, and I've gone. Like, split second. You know, they say don't change your mind, yeah. and I've gone. Like, I know he knows I'm going to his left. And, and then I've, I've got to change it, change it. And then I've gone like, no, do what you normally do. And I've just and I've just put the top corner and I'm like thinking, if, and I know if I'd gone the other way, I know I, I felt I would have missed. Yeah. Um, I still remember it now. Could you, could you have waited for him to move and then play no, it? No, because it, it, it was about me. I knew where I was going to put the ball. Mm. Uh, and I had to have that mindset of, because if he'd gone that way and then I went, oh, now I'll change my mind. No. Uh, but it's, it, it, again, I think penalty taking is... Uh, people may, may not remember uh, Matt Letizia he was absolutely phenomenal and he could put the ball wherever he wanted I took penalties very rarely did I change I think probably the only but one of the goalkeepers that uh, didn't go the right way or go the opposite way was Simon Tracy mm. um, uh, and he's one of those I tried giving him the eyes putting the ball down looking that way I'm going to put it that way and put it out, I'm going to smash it and he's just totally oblivious um, he said he didn't catch me uh, he didn't see me giving him the eyes he, just, he was lucky on that day <laughs> um, so, so no the penalties is one of, did you used to take penalties no, yourself? No. I, so everything you described there is my worst nightmare so if I was to be stepping up for a penalty I if, was it's, up. if it's a shootout what number are you, going, are you <laughs> likely to be? Listen 11 11? <laughs> <laughs> I like for me I used to this is my this is my pain yeah. so the under 21s 2009 we practiced penalties all summer yeah. and to the keeper's right I always struck it well yeah. but it was always saved yeah. to the keeper's left it would always go in but it was never near the corner yeah. so when we came to the penalty shootout Stu Pierce manager at the time he had a list of everyone to go in their order and he knew where everyone scored and missed yeah. to the point where he was going to tell us where we should kick the ball yeah and I was so worried that if I went to the keeper's left and the keeper went that way, it'd be the worst penalty you've ever seen in all your days. <laughs> but thankfully, it didn't get to me and we got through. But in my mind, I think they're two different types of people. There are the ones who are excited about scoring yeah. and the ones who are nervous about missing. Yeah. And I was very much the latter. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I was nowhere near a penalty shooter. If, if I was on the field and our team won one, I'd be in the stands just to yeah. make sure nobody knew that. I, was, I had nothing to do with it, my friend, yeah. nothing at all. Oh, I'm, a, I'm not sure about that. Sorry, is that me? Oh. Was that, that, right. I think it's, 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 there's nothing better than having that, you know, when you put the ball down on the spot and yeah. you know that everybody in the whole stadium is looking at you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the worst, that's my it, worst nightmare. Is it? Oh, no, so I worst enjoyed nightmare. that. And then you, but then, then you need that strength, that, that, that uh, the courage in your convictions of where you're going to put it. If the goalkeeper saves it, great save. Yeah. But, I, I'd always worried that the goalkeeper would look at me and say, I know where you're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, oh, crap. <laughs> what do I do now? Because <laughs> it's the whole bluff, double bluff. Well, yeah. what happens if he does? Yeah. And then, Joe Hart oh, used to do that, didn't he? Yeah, yeah and that's why I used to score against him. Yeah, and most of the time he did kind of know. He wouldn't necessarily always save it. But it does. It, just think about that for a second, like everyone <laughs> listening. If a goalie says he knows where you're going to go and he's a very good goalie, what would you do? <laughs> just think about that. What would you do? Uh, yeah. Uh, goalkeeper uh, though I love penalties so uh, I can't lose so, uh, yeah. uh, the goalkeepers can't can yeah. Yeah, yeah, easiest job in the world yeah. um, Helen on Twitter says both Keith and Nadam came back to play against City after leaving what's it like coming back to an old club can players ever offer can players ever offer insight into strengths and weaknesses or what certain ex-teammates are like or if easy to wind up yeah definitely um, again, when you when you're at a club, I, I think I, I was at City for five years, and then I left and went, went to Wolves and came back. Um, I knew the club inside out. Um, I wouldn't say I don't think as a reflection on the, on the result uh, per, per se, um, but and 
I think you can have an influence if you're a, if you if you're a player that had good stature at the football club. I think you uh, you can give that confidence to your teammates uh, in and around you if you're if you're a presence if that's if that's the type of personality that you are. Um, which did I enjoy going back to City? Um, yeah, I did. I, I did go back because I knew what the football club was like. I was yeah. lucky. I got I got a good welcome as well. Even though some some people do say that I left on bad terms, it wasn't. I think we had a conversation earlier on that where the timing of when I left when the club got relegated wasn't my choice. I still had two seasons, uh, two years left on my contract. I wanted to stay. It was a decision by the football club that they were going down a route whereby they had to change the finances of the football club. In the, in the modern day now, when they're saying that oh, I was overpaid at the time or, or earning too much money at the time now, that you think, wow. Mm. Yeah, I retired too early, didn't <laughs> yeah. I? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, for me, going back for the first time was like was really weird because it's all I'd ever known. Yeah. You know, I was in the academy from the age of 10. So then to go back and play there, it's weird to call the Etihad away, you know, to see some of the people working for City and to see that, like, I'm not the person that's here anymore. That was strange. But then in regards to, like... Is that hard? Is that hard to... It depends if you support the club or not. So for, for me, that actually supported the club properly, like, it was a bit weird because yeah. I'm, I'm close with everyone that was there because I've been friends with them for years. Um, coming back for the first time, you don't really support it. It's like, you know, it is whatever it is. But the insight thing, I think it only goes so far mm. because say when I came back with QPR, I could say to my teammates, Sergio Girl likes to do this. Yaya Toure likes to do that. David Silva likes to do that. But Doesn't we don't... Doesn't mean they will. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 not even that. Like, so what? They're still better than us. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, we can say what their tendencies are, but it doesn't mean that you can instantly negate them because that, like, when we came as QPR, we were the team that was 17 from the Premier League yeah. going up against a team that dropped two points at home all season. Listen, I could tell them exactly what they do. Tell them how they brush their teeth if you wanted. But realistically, how does that mean that we're going to be able to stop you? Like, the matchup in midfield was like Sean Derry plus another versus Yaya Turing Gareth Barry you're still overmatched regardless of whether you tell someone what they're going to do or not. Like David Silver's a genius. If I say that, it's like me saying, think of it this way. It's the simplest way to describe it. I said to I said to the uh, the right, the left back or whatever, oh, with David Silver, he prefers to go on his left. That's, now what? That's <laughs> it, standard. Yeah, yeah. Now, now what? What more, what more can you say? Yeah, like, well, you've prepped him as much as you want. Well, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So the insight's there and you can say stuff, but sometimes for the way City are, especially at that time, they're just so much better than everybody else that ultimately yeah. you can tell them what they're going to do, but it doesn't mean you're going to be able to stop it. Yeah. Uh, final question comes uh, from uh, John on Twitter who says, uh, people talk about the impact of negative stories in the press before big games. How much is the dressing room even aware of them? Uh, of big stories? Yeah. A lot of players nowadays, they live on social media. They're, they're aware of it, what effect it has on it. Um, I don't, um, not really sure now because I think that the modern day footballer now they know that they're living in a goldfish bowl. Um, while at the truth, spoil a good story, probably ninety percent of what's said uh, or what's printed or publicised isn't true. And I think the players nowadays uh, they they deal with that. Just they brush it off. Um, negativity courts company if you allow something somebody else's opinion somebody else's view somebody else's thoughts uh, affect you as an individual the, then that's a different issue for you to deal with what yeah. what what, would you, what is the negative story well i'm interested in your thoughts because you've talked about um player ratings before mm. and how mm. like seeing player ratings in, in the papers and, and online can affect you um mm. just a negative story in the sense of i guess I don't know. Maybe, maybe an opinion piece that uh, that about the individual, about the individual, or about the club, or well, about the performance. It might, be, it might be now, but everybody now will have an opinion on what yeah. Arsenal's mindset is going to be and where they've where they've potentially lost it. Not not one that they're in the last four games now. If you if you get involved in that negativity. It's um, just spirals. It can spiral. Be an yeah. individual. Have your own thoughts. Have your own opinions. You know if you've played well. You know if the, you know if you haven't won in four games uh, and you're at the top of the table and you're trying you're trying to go for the to win the title. You know you need to win a game. I, I think in regards to that, um, you could try and say have the blinkers on and disregard anything that's being said on social media and the like. But say a manager of a football club, especially at the sort of highest highest division, they're doing press conferences all the time. And some of the narrative, the external narratives get delivered to you whether you pay attention or not. Like someone, it would be the nature of the question. So, Mikel, it's been four games now where your team haven't yeah. managed to win. And as a consequence, it looks like you guys are really low on form. How does this feel, blah, 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 blah. And he'll have to answer that question. And the players will probably see him answer that question. Yeah. But the manager's not had that thought. But somebody's presented a thought onto them. Yeah. And I think there's a big disconnect between 
how we perceive football from the outside versus how they do it on the inside. Like they might be low on confidence, but they also might believe that they're going to go through and win the league still, you know. But when you always ask the questions from your own perspective, it's almost like, well, of course, this is the way that they think. And I think it can affect some people when you're not doing so well. But ultimately, a lot of the people who talk about it, like I, whenever I talk about football, I always like have this little caveat that I don't have a clue what's going on. Yeah, <laughs> I can give my opinion about what I think is going on. Yep. But unless one of those people's talking to you openly about how a situation is, you don't, don't have really a clue. Yeah. Do not. I do not know. We can speculate, but we do not know. We can talk about my past experiences, but I do not know. So when other people who haven't been involved in the game, haven't played the game for a second, deliver really big opinions, negative, positive, whatever, do you think people look to them for validation? I think when Guardiola gets asked a question like that, he gives the eyes, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, because he knows it's like, it's, it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, it's crap. Like, some of it's crap, but then in the same breath, I think some fans get really upset about other people's opinions when they don't need to. Yeah. Like, but there was um, there's a lady, I, I apologise if she's listening, I forgot your name, I'm sorry. But she was upset because Dion Dublin thought that Arsenal were going to win the game yesterday. And she said, people are rooting against us, want us to lose. I said, he doesn't want you to lose. I said, ultimately, he's had to make a prediction about a game of football. And there's a big difference between what you sort of predict and what you want to happen. Because the prediction doesn't come with a want. You won't find them saying, I want Arsenal to win this game. It's like, this is my prediction based on X, Y, and Z. Yeah. That's it. You know? I, still, I still think Dion's doing well on uh, Holmes under the hammer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then instead, you're like, they take offence to it. But it's not. It's just a, it's like a game prediction. And most of the time, we're wrong. Yeah. Start the year, we've got to do a top six or top four prediction. I don't have a clue. Yeah. You know what I mean? But whatever I put, like, all the Chelsea fans a year ago were disgusted by me putting them in fourth. Disgusted. And that's responsible. Take fourth now, wouldn't they? <laughs> Listen, that's responsible. A few of them saying, just in case you didn't know, this was before a ball was kicked. I had no idea. Okay. Yeah. So everyone thinks they're going to do well. Unfortunately, not everyone can do well in a season. Well, yeah. Who would have thought beginning of the season that uh, Brighton and Villa would be above Chelsea and Liverpool? Oh, who, who would have predicted that? It's crazy, crazy, yeah. crazy, crazy. What, what we're learning here is that things like this are just background noise and people shouldn't be listening to us and somehow we've got to 500 episodes. <laughs> I, so can, I, can I say, by the way, I think anyone that's listened to all 500 needs to reach out to you. <laughs> yeah. they deserve a round well, of I, I've, I've been doing a little bit of, uh, I've been doing a little bit of housekeeping and, and kind of updating a, a record of, of the podcast that we've done. I'm still, I, I'm only up to the end of season 10 and to listen to all of them, it's taken a fortnight of your life so far. Yeah. So, uh, like, honestly... Like, why are you still here? I find it, why, I find, why are you all still here? I, I, find it, I find it curious that you started the podcast after I left City. <laughs> no, you were there. Friend. You were there. 2009, you were there. Yeah, well, I thought you said 10 before. I find, <laughs> I find it curious, my friend, but still, you carry on. <laughs> yes, well, that brings us to an end of this very, very special Blue Moon podcast. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you to my guests for this one, Nada Manua. Absolute pleasure, sir. And Keith Cole. Pleasure. And a big... <laughs> is this me or is this you? It's not me. Sorry. I was, what was that? Sorry. Do are you, you, listen, that are you listening to podcasts while we're doing <laughs> the podcast? How's the podcast just started playing on my phone? <laughs> Spooky. So do you want to do it's that? Get, do it's okay, because I'll just pick up from the, uh, okay. the last line. And a big thank you as well for sticking with the show all these years to get us to 500 episodes. Here's to the next 500. <laughs>